For people that are concerned about the COVID vaccines or people who are hesitant or for people who have flat out said they're not going to be vaccinated, I think, you know, the first thing that they really need to do is I, I think that they need to take a long, hard look at what their risk is if they get infected. The messenger RNA vaccines have now been dosed in over 80 million people and the side effects are minimal and these vaccines are safe. Messenger RNA is a, a genetic code that tells our cells uh, to make proteins and it could be uh, either new proteins that serve a specific purpose or it could be uh, proteins to uh, participate in some kind of repair uh, process. What scientists did was they captured viruses from patients, from people, and they sequenced or basically figured out what the genetic fingerprint looked like. And they figured out the specific part that codes for the spike protein. And the spike protein is really important because it's the kind of finger-like projection off the virus that allows the virus to attach to a cell and invade and infect the cell. And so what the scientists did was they took that specific messenger RNA code, they put it into this lipid nanoparticle, and that's what makes up the foundation of the vaccine. And so when you inject the vaccine into somebody, uh, those lipid nanoparticles carry that code into muscle cells and um, immune cells that we have in our bodies. And the cell looks at the code and says, I am supposed to make spike protein. And so it starts to manufacture these spike proteins and then the body recognizes those proteins as not supposed to be there, foreign, and the body mounts an immune response against those spike proteins. And that's how the vaccine induces immunity. The difference between the messenger RNA vaccines and the viral vectored vaccine, so the viral vectored vaccine is Johnson & Johnson, um, it's what the, what the carrier is. So with the messenger RNA vaccines, the carrier is the lipid nanoparticle. With the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, the carrier is actually a human uh, adenovirus. The passenger to the adenovirus is the spike protein DNA code. And so it's really the carrier which is different, but the common, it's a common pathway at the end, which is, tell the body to make an immune response against spike protein. There are three different vaccines under emergency use right now. Moderna and Pfizer had very similar uh, efficacy, so 94, 95%, which means that you know, people who got vaccine, their risk of getting COVID was reduced by 95% compared to people who did not get the vaccine. That number is 66% for the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Uh, it's, but you got to break it down. It's a little bit different because the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, they looked at the ability of those vaccines to prevent any COVID of any severity. Whereas the Johnson & Johnson trial, they looked specifically at the ability to prevent moderate or severe COVID. So they were a little bit more specific. The other thing about you know, Johnson & Johnson you have to look at is they did it in multiple different countries. They had it in the United States, Brazil, in South Africa, and we know that in South Africa and Brazil, the predominant strains that were circulating are these variants that we're all concerned about. So in the U.S., the efficacy was actually 72 percent. So it was about 10 percent higher uh, than what it looks at at you know a, a global level. The other thing, though, is it was higher in preventing hospitalization, preventing severe disease, and not a single person who got vaccinated died of COVID. So I think when you look at all the vaccines in terms of their ability to prevent death or prevent severe disease or hospitalization, they're all pretty equivalent. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine and the Novavax vaccine, uh, those were both, uh, those trials were conducted in multiple countries to include uh, South Africa and uh, Brazil where these concerning variants are the predominant strains that are circulating. And yes, in fact, it did look like uh, the vaccine uh, worked less well in, uh, in those countries. Uh, for the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine, we know from work that they've done in the laboratory that the, the antibodies that those vaccines produce uh, in people when the, in the lab, when they try to use those antibodies to, to neutralize these variants, uh, they're not as good at neutralizing those variants as they are at 
uh, the predominant strain that's in, you know in the U.S., which is from uh, which is from China. The experiments are continuing. Uh, there is some concerning uh, data there, which is why it's important that we vaccinate as many people as possible because it's a race against uh, the variants. Uh, getting people vaccinated quicker than the variants have an opportunity to spread. It's important to try to get those two-dose vaccines as close to the schedule that they were tested uh, as possible because that's the information that we have, right? So the uh, vaccines were shown to be safe and effective based upon the dosing schedule that was used in the clinical trials. Uh, but you know, that's not always possible in the real world. And so in general, we recommend that people not get a second dose early. Uh, if there has to be some kind of um, maneuvering with the schedule, we recommend that people actually delay instead of getting uh, earlier. Herd immunity is a concept. If you vaccinate a certain percent of a population, there is so much immunity within that population that it's very difficult for the virus to spread. Right now, about 15% of the country has received at least one dose of vaccine. That's a far cry from the 70, 80% that we're, that we're going to need. I don't believe that it's gonna be a vaccine supply issue. So it really is more of an issue. Are people going to be willing to get vaccinated because if they are, we're vaccinating 2 million people a day. If that were to go to 3 million, and we have 320 million people in the country, we could achieve herd immunity uh, by late summer. So there's a couple of uh, elements that will contribute to whether or not we're gonna need to have annual boosters. One of those is how long will the immunity that the current vaccines offer us, how long is that immunity going to last. And we don't know that, but these trials have all been designed so that they go on for multiple, multiple years. We're following people longitudinally to determine you know, whether or not a boost will be, uh, will be required. The second element in, in that is uh, the, the variant issue and whether or not uh, the vaccines that were rolled out first are a good enough match to protect people against uh, disease caused by these variants. And those are, uh, again, you know, we've seen that the vaccines can be less effective, but it's not 0%, right? I mean, these vaccines still are working at 50, 60% efficacy against these new variants, which just to put it in context, the annual flu vaccine is about 45%. The Pfizer trial started with 18 to 85 year olds and then it quickly went to 16 and 17 year olds and now we're finishing up the 12 to 15 year olds. COVID affects so many different groups in so many different ways and so even though we know that you know the majority of kids are going to do fine if they get COVID, they're still going to bring that virus into the home where there are people who are at high risk of a bad outcome if they get infected um, and so it's important to immunize children. It's important to immunize children so that they can go to, uh, go to school. So, so I anticipate we're going to start seeing a lot of data in, 20, um, you know, in 2021 that looks at other, other populations.